Hello everyone and welcome to one more Indusoft webinar from our monthly webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about interoperability and communication tools. So this is our agenda. We're going to have a brief introduction about what we're going to be talking about and then we're going to visit the main two topics of today's webinar. We're going to talk about some of the benefits of using OPC UA for communicating with absolutely everything. We're not talking about uh, communicating with PLCs only. Uh, that's, you know, the most common use for a software like ours. Uh, any HMI or SCADA software, we have to bring data from devices to present to the user. And so there are new approaches regarding that, uh, regarding OPC UA, but more than that, nowadays we have to be able to connect the plant floor all the way to the enterprise and how OPC UA can be uh, the choice for that. And then we're going to visit a topic uh, called SNMP because not only our HMI software, our SCADA software, in software Type Studio can talk to PLCs and other uh, controllers, other type of uh, controller systems, but also we can serve as a network monitoring system. So we're going to learn a little bit about uh, the SNP features that we have on Indusoft and how other projects can benefit with that. So again, our two main topics today are going to be OPC UA, SNP, which will include live demos as well. So starting uh, from the introduction, what is Indusoft Web Studio? This is our development tool and deployment tool that is very easy to use where you can configure and design projects for data communication, for data manipulation, and data presentation. You can visualize this data on your computer, you can visualize on your cell phone, on your tablet, doesn't matter which OS you are running there. You can communicate with almost every single uh, automation controller that there is in the market using our communication drivers and you can generate data logs and you can create screens to present this data and for all of that you can use our product in the soft web studio. Furthermore, when you need to exchange data with any other device or services or packages, we offer multiple possibilities. So we have the communication drivers, we have OPC in all the different flavors, OPC Classic, OPC.NET, and OPC UA, and even inside of our built-in functions, we have the possibility of exchanging data as well. First, let's take a look on the internal architecture of the product, how that works, so we will get a better understanding how our features and our tools are going to work. We have a main core thing here, the tags engine, uh, that's our tags database, and several other tasks, and those tasks, they are connected to each other through the tags database. So if I'm using our communication driver to get a data from a field device, we get the data, we throw it to the tags database, and from the tags database, we are going to, for instance, use the background tasks to generate an alarm, or save a trend history, or we're going to also use that guide to send to our TCP IP server, and for the TCP IP server, we're going to visualize that data on our local viewer, or for the TCP IP server, we're going to deploy that data to remote stations, remote secure viewer, web sync clients, mobile access, any uh, visualization uh, tool that we have. This is just a quick summary of how the internal architecture of the product works. Next, let's talk about connectivity. So, inside in Software Studio, as you can see on this slide, we have several different possibilities of exchanging data, and you can see some of the screenshots there. So I'm gonna go quickly over some of them. We're gonna start here on the top of our web solution, where we can get uh, all the screens that we create. We can display exactly the screen the same way using our Web Sync Client solution based on Internet Explorer, and more and more features you are able to visualize using our mobile access, where you can see data using your iPhone, your Android-based phone, or uh, your tablet using Android or iOS, or even uh, the Microsoft mobile operating system. You can visualize that data, you can visualize that screen. And then as we go uh, counterclockwise, we talk about OPC clients. On the OPC 
uh, we have all the different OPC flavors, and today we're going to focus on the OPC E8 communications. Go now and go to the communication drivers to all the PLCs on the market, including some custom uh, drivers that we have written over time. One of them is a driver called TXRX, where you can just send custom messages to you know anyone using a serial port or TCP/IP, and also receive uh, messages from these guys. It can be on hex format, binary format, or I string or you know text-based formats. As we go down, we have the driver database API that allows uh, third-party users to interact with our software, so they can write their own programs and get that from our text database, or you can write your own communication driver using our toolkits, using our APIs. The next we have uh, XML using our recipes. We can read the values, we can save data into XML. We have ODBC and ADO to access any relational database. And even the legacy DBE is still on the product if by any chance you have to do that. We are still uh, keeping that on the product for now, but even the operating system is making it difficult to use DBE these days. And then as you go to the client stations, we're talking about our uh, existing OPC server that we have on the product, this is the OPC classic that we have. We have gateways for different packages as well, uh, including one we're in touch and our TCP IP task, which is the server, used uh, not only to send data to our local viewer, but also to remote visualization devices, third party systems, secure viewer, and allows us to exchange data in real time between two different projects. So today we're going to focus on one of the drivers, some of the uh, features that we use in our APIs and OPC. First of all, let's discuss a little bit about OPC UA. So the OPC UA was uh, first released in 2008. We first started hearing about it back in 2005. So it was a lot of effort until you had the first uh, spec out in the market and the first people integrating it. Uh, is a platform independent. We're going to discuss a little bit further on the next slide, but it's very good because it's not based on Windows only. OPC Classic was a great solution back in the day based on DCOM, so it was tied up to Windows only. Nowadays, you can put an OPC UA server even inside your own PLC. Okay? It incorporates all the OPC Classic specification, which means UA includes the data acquisition part. That's the most uh, commonly used but also historical data, alarm and events, also uh, not notifications, data exchange, XMLDA, batch, all those things that we had on the uh, OPC Classic the specification, just one specification, which is the UA. And what we're going to uh, enforce today, we are going to uh, talk a lot about, going to be the security. So OPC UA is secure because it includes encryption, it includes authentication, it includes auditing data. Everything that happens can be logged, can be recorded. Okay, it allows us to achieve other goals for security, for platform independence, and performance and growth with uh, the tranquility that we know our data is secure, and it is extensible. You can add new features without affecting the existing application. So if you have developed an OPC server, you can put on the market and you can add more to it as time goes by. Summary of some of the uh, nice functionalities that we have on the OPC UA. Discovery. The discovery allows you to uh, enter, let's say, an IP address and look for all the OPC servers on that specific IP address. Oh, that's similar to what we had on uh, on Classic, yes, as long as you're able to run the OPC enum on both computers and have the DCOM port open and have the uh, firewall allowing the OPC enum. So it was going still through DCOM that by default the operating system doesn't allow DCOM to be as open because it was also a very good path for viruses and other malwares to get into your computer. So the discovery is a specific service and it finds all the available OPC servers and that can be configurable. Uh, the OPC server may not want you to be able to discover it. So you will enter the IP and you'll not find the OPC server there. So uh, it's up to the server to make it discoverable or not. There are developments on the global discovery service where you scan a network and you find all the OPC servers on that network. That's even better, not implemented uh, on our product, but uh, available uh, only as part of the OPC specification. 
address space. All the data is represented hierarchically, so you can see a tree view. So it's very easy to uh, to get compact structures visualized, and we can access that specific data that we want using the OPC client. You're going to see as you start browsing some of the data on the OPC server, the amount of data that we can uh, access and how easy it is to access that. We have the option to read and write on demand based, of course, on access permissions. We're going to talk about the security on that. Uh, when you're configuring the server, we may make a data read-only. We don't want someone to write something to the PLC or to write something to my service. We can make it uh, uh, read only, or if I need to write something, we can make that specific element read and, readable and writable. And we have the subscriptions. So with this, we're going to receive the data only when the data, uh, or only when the server wants us to receive that data. Let's say the data changes, it sends me that information. I don't need to be pulling uh, the data all the time, only when uh, an event happens, when uh, a value changes, then the server send that information to all the subscribers, optimizing a lot of the network traffic. Events, events and alarms, any important information that you have configured on the server that you want the client to receive, we have that. Uh, on InSoft Web Studio, we even have the, uh, the OPC alarm and events uh, on, on the product where we receive alarms directly from the server and display on our alarm object. And methods, that's one of the uh, most interesting things that I find, let's say you have a controller, you have a device that you wrote a method, the OPC client can call that method, can call the method to be executed. In the past, what would you do? We would, let's say, send a tag that would send a set of the elements, the POC would scan that elements and execute that method. With OPC UA, you can execute the method directly. It's prepared to do that. The other great advantage of OPC UA, as we're going to discuss now, is the platform independence. What I really like about the platform independence is that you can have OPC servers in any type of device. I have a friend, he, uh, he worked for a, a nice startup here in Austin, and they started developing their own uh, device. And how are they creating the interoperability for that device? They put OPC UA on a microchip on a microcontroller. And using our client, we can exchange data with that controller, which is not a PLC or anything like that. It's something very specific for home automation. Okay? So we can have OPC UA servers on traditional PC, like ours, but also on cloud-based cloud servers, on inside a PLC, inside of specific controllers, let's say ARM-based, so we are not tied up on the second point to Microsoft Windows only. We have on the market OPC servers for uh, Apple OS, we have for Android, we have on any distribution of Linux, even on Raspberry Pi out there. If you look around, you're going to find several OPC servers that run inside the Raspberry Pi. So the OPC UA specification provides all the necessary infrastructure for interoperability across the enterprise from machine to machine let's say from controller to controller, I want to exchange data between PLC A and PLC B. They don't speak the same protocol. No, they don't, but they both speak OPC. Great, they don't need to be on Windows. They don't need to configure anything come because they're not even running on Windows, but I can exchange data between PLC A and PLC B using OPC. Several PLCs there, they have function blocks for OPC client and uh, they implement the OPC server. So I can get a uh, good picture brands. I can get uh, my uh, back-off PLC with an OPC UA block on it, reading data from my Bosch PLC through OPC as well. They don't need to speak the same protocol. They can exchange data. And even better, they can exchange secure data between these two PLCs. So uh, I borrowed this slide from the OPC Foundation presentation showing the possibility of the OPC UA where you can put uh, the servers, we're not talking about clients only, both client and server, they can go to these two places, to a, a micro, uh, to a microchip, to a tablet, to a Windows CE server, or uh, iPhones, as you can see, several possibilities. Let's discuss now the uh, OPC UA security. So uh, first, let's think about a traditional communication from an HMI to the PLC. 
you should be serial connections. Could be RS232, could be RS485. I'm going to go to a network. I send a buffer. I get a buffer back. I process that information. Display on the screen. Good. Then Ethernet came. Excellent. Much, much faster and much more possibilities. You can have uh, several PLCs connected to the same switch, and we can talk to all the PLCs all at the same time. Right? So the traditional communication method that I would go uh, from the HMI, I prepare the buffer, send to the PLC, and receive the answer back. It still works pretty well on controlled environments, but as we have even more concerns about cybersecurity and we have even more distributed systems, we have to revisit the security requirements for our projects. So with OPC UA in the security, let's read some of the uh, most important considerations that we have about uh, a security on your project. So on OPC UA, we have up here that it is firewall friendly. What, what do we mean with that? You have the only one specific port that you're going to have to open, and on OPC UA, one of the specs, you can use HTTP, which goes to the port 80, which is a port that is never blocked. Okay, or if you're going to go OPC.TCP, that's going to be always the same port, the only one that you have to open. Transport, numerous protocol are uh, supported. The OPC binary is the real, really fast one, but also uh, other protocols that are compatible with SOAP and HTTPS, for example, may not be as fast, but we are, uh, depend on the project, that may be the right choice for the transport layer. Session encryption. All the messages are transmitted securely. If I put a sniffer between my HMI and my PLC, we can see the bytes that are being exchanged. Some protocols, they're open. Modbus protocol is open. Uh, Macnet protocol is open. So we can put a sniffer there, and we can see the data that's being exchanged between my HMI and the PLC. If I'm on a controlled network, that's great. I'm inside my company. I'm not connecting to the internet. I'm not connecting my device to the internet, anything like this. So I'm not running into any risk. But those messages are not encrypted. Anyone can read uh, that can read the protocol, can read these messages. With a session encryption, all the data that's being exchanged is encrypted. So with OPC UA, if you decide to use encryption, even if you put a sniffer between uh, the server and the client that can go through firewalls, that can go through the internet to other parts of the road, you will not be able to understand the message that is in there. Message signing, that also verifies the consistency of the message. The message is are received exactly the same way as they were sent. If anything uh, enters, if you have any injection in there, that message is going to be rejected. Sequenced packages, we exposure to message uh, replay attacks is eliminated with sequencing. So if you try to replay the same message, we're going to have the same ID and this type of thing, the message is going to be rejected. Authentication. So the client and the server can be identified through OpenSSL certificates. We're going to talk a little bit about certificates on the next slide, but it provides control over which application can access that information. So uh, with a PLC, if I start my Ubisoft project to connect to the PLC, I can talk to it. If we start uh, another package, the programming software, or another HMI package, we can still talk to the same PLC, right? Some PLCs, we can configure security based on IP. So only the specific IP address will be able to connect to that PLC. When you're talking about a larger system that may include different networks, that may even include uh, internet, it's hard to have a fixed IP address or you know this type of uh, specific security. When you talk about uh, authentication and user control, you can decide only who has my certificate will be able to access my application. So I provide the certificate, I approve that client to connect to my server, or I approve that server for my client to connect to. So now we know who has access to what information, okay? And user control, user and password, which are encrypted as well. So even if you put a, a sniffer there trying to see uh, the authentication, the user and password that we are sending, you will not be able to understand that data because OPC UA implements the level of authentication that makes that information safe and auditing. So we can uh, implement on the OPC auditing that everything that happens can be logged 
and we can have a knotted trail. So if anyone wrote uh, a bit or read a bit or uh, executed a method, that information can be logged. So on this uh, chart here, we can see how the uh, security would work. So I have a server. The server is going to have what we call the trust list of certificates, which is who are the clients that are you allowed to connect to that server. As a client, I'm going to try to connect to that server and say, here's my certificate. Can I connect? If the server says, uh, yes, I know who you are in the soft, you can connect. And here's my certificate as well. The client says, okay, good, I trust you as well. So then on the client, we create the trust list of all the servers that we have connected to. So now that configuration or that communication can happen. Just remembering that each message is signed, so we prevent tampering. Uh, the sequence message uh, prevents also injection, one of the, uh, the threats that we can uh, get rid of when you use the security. The connection is, can be encrypted, but also, if you want to eliminate all of that, let's say you just want to have your own secure uh, environment, but you want to exchange data between two devices, and the only protocol they speak is OPC, UA, that's fine as well. You don't have to configure the security. But depending on the project, if you need to have security, as you can see, there are several options offered with OPC UA. So on this next slide here, we can see that the authentication can, uh, as you can see with the, uh, with the pictures here, we can prove who, who we are on the certificate to include our information. And then the server can look on that and decide, uh, yes, do I, uh, do I know you? Like, are you in the soft? You look on the certificate, you look at the certificate could be signed by uh, uh, an, an authority, so you can validate everybody that's uh, validated by that uh, signed author, uh, authority, like VeriSign, for instance, you can allow them because you trust that uh, authority. Or if it's self-signed, you're going to see, oh, who are you? I'm in the soft, so I can allow that, so you can prove who you are. And on this slide here on the bottom, we can see, you know, uh, the thief saying, you cannot, you cannot even understand what is on the encryption. What about, you know, encryption plus, you know, username and password? So you're really securing your communication when you are using OPC UA. So the advances on the OPC UA uh, are pretty big that even allow it to cooperate with other organizations. Here you see some of them. Uh, for instance, we have here uh, PLC Open and OPC UA. They are really tied together uh, is to create uh, PLC Open. Of course, you can have more information about it, but you can write a logic and run that logic on any PLC. And how are you going to communicate? You can communicate to any device using OPC UA, for instance. Backnet, the Backnet Association is mapping Backnet uh, elements into uh, the OPC UA communication model. And uh, think about this, you can have devices, BACnet devices, those are automation, that simply on the device itself, it speaks BACnet, good, but it speaks the same uh, communication model through OPC UA. So the possibilities are huge. On this next slide, I'm going to just show uh, some specific uh, markets where OPC UA got now that OPC Classic never even uh, stood a chance before. Oil and gas is one of them. Uh, in the past, it was very hard to find uh, anyone on the oil and gas market that would trust communication between different plants, between uh, enterprise and uh, and the, the plant floor using OPC. Of course, on a controlled environment, you had OPC uh, from the PLC to the uh, to the DCS system, great, we do have OPC, but from up, let's bring that up to, uh, to the enterprise. That communication usually will not be trusted to OPC only. And on, with OPC UA, with all the security and all the authentication, that is happening. And here we are showing four uh, collaboration teams that are working uh, with oil and gas, drilling system automation, uh, the standard leadership council, that we uh, that we can access using OPC UA. Uh, I just had a quick question here that popped up, and 
I probably forgot to mention in the beginning of the meeting, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end, and I'm going to answer all the questions at the end. Uh, right now, if you're on the webinar, it may look like you're the only one, but no, we got plenty of people here on the webinar. Uh, we just do not show everybody that is connected to, uh, to the users. So uh, I'm going to try to avoid answering questions during the presentation, but I'm going to read everything on the chat and on the Q&A uh, to answer all the questions you guys may have, okay? But quickly answering the question, can, can we have more than one OPC UA server on the same machine? Yes, definitely. Uh, the only thing you have to configure is they cannot share the same TCP IP port. They're going to conflict. But you can have as many OPC UA servers as you want on the same machine or the same device. Let's play a little bit with OPC UA now using a live demo. So I'm going to switch now out of the PowerPoint. And I'm going to go to my Indusoft Web Studio here. So which OPC UA am I going to connect? How am I going to connect? I got a couple of OPC UA that I can access here on my network. And the first one that I'm going to connect to is going to be uh, I'm running on a remote machine. I have here a machine where I'm running back off Twincat version 3.1. I don't know exactly the build that we have there. So on back off, I'm running here. The PLC program, I have some tags changing values, uh, a very, very simple logic, only, uh, as you can see, I'm basically only counting up uh, some devices, uh, some some, uh, some addresses here, some are read-only, some are read and write. So using backups OPC UA configurators, we can configure the, the different type of uh, communications that we want to have, uh, historical access, we are not talking about this on this webinar, but we're going to talk about the server security. So first, we configure which port that server is going to be. So if we need to open a port, there's going to be only one specific port, which is the 4848, all right? And then uh, we decide which uh, security models we want to have available. If I don't want anonymous access, I will just uncheck this box. And I will enforce the user and password access only. And also the encryption. If I want to have sign and encrypt, you want going to have no security at all, or sign and encrypt using 256, that is what's, what is implemented on this server. Okay? So right now, I do have here on my example a certificate that we have accepted. I'm going to delete the certificate. As you can see, that was the Indusoft certificate. I'm going to delete that. Okay, so right now, if I want to use security, I will not be able to connect to this server from my Indusoft project. Okay, so because I allowed the endpoint with no security here and anonymous access on this OPC server, if I go here on Indusoft Web Studio and how the OPC UA works on Web Studio, we create a connection. And then we create worksheets with that connection. So uh, let's start from the beginning. So I'm going to create here OPC UA webinar, uh, create a new project. So I'm going to go here on the communication, and I'm going to go to OPC UA and create my first connection. So I'm going to connect with uh, Twincat. And this first connection is, is uh, going to be uh, secure. So I will not use any encryption. It's just going to be uh, a clear connection. So let me check this information here. On this data access, we show here what's going to be the port number. So I'm going to have to enter the IP address of this server on my Web Studio project. So in the port 4848, if I look on the security here, I haven't configured any security on this window. And if I do a test connection, 
it did not like my connection. And in part because I put the wrong IP address. So now it's searching my network for that specific IP address. Of course, it did not find anything. If I put here the correct IP address and I do a load service list, it did not find any server. So the discovery service is not exactly uh, happening right now. So if I put here the right IP address and try to connect to it, so the connection was established. And it was established without any security because here on my server, I allow the endpoint with no security. Okay, so once I have that connection, connection clear, I can look on, on the OPC server. So I can select here my connection and I can associ start associating my Web Studio tags with server information. And look how great it is to access the server information. I can right click, browse, and here I have all the information model from the server, all the other spaces. So there's information about the PLC, the information about the server. So namespace, you can see here the values that we have, the server status, right? We have here start time, current time on the server. We have the current state on the server. So all the information is available there for all the clients to see, okay? So a, a quick test here, I'm gonna go and go on the PLC program part where I have an integer variable and I have associated that to a tag. I have here the uh, node ID. So I'm gonna put here my Web Studio tag. I'm gonna call this uh, Twinket uh, int var. I create the tag and we save. All right, so I can put now this tag anywhere on my project. I can put on my screens, I can put on my trend charts, I can put on my alarms. Since right now what we are validating or what we are testing is only the communication with OPC, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get this tag here and use the tool that we have for debugging called Database Pi. With the Database Pi, I can put the variable that I want here Okay, and I can enable also all my OPC messages here on the other tool called output window. I can go here, check OPC UA, and I can choose if I wanna log the message about reading, about writing, connections, subscriptions, errors, warning, both. So we can uh, have an idea of everything that is happening during the OPC UA communications. So for my debugging uh, purpose here, I'm gonna run only the OPC UA task so we can see the values being exchanged. For that, I can go here on the tasks tab where we have all the runtime tasks. So I can click here on the OPC UA client runtime and start only that specific test task. So we are connecting to the server now. And we are getting the data. All right, you can see the data being updated here. It's updated uh, much faster uh, than, than you can see here, right? It all depends on how we configure that. If we put a publish rate faster, then uh, if you don't put anything, it's gonna be uh, a thousand milliseconds or we can improve this or depending on how much we want to overload the network as well. Okay, and then we can put as many data as we want, as many information as we want from the server. Okay, so let's talk, but this is a insecure connection. We did not configure any security. So let's start to configure a secu uh, security. I'm gonna create now a connection that's gonna go to the same OPC server, but I'm gonna use security now. So this is gonna be Twinket, secure, same endpoint. And we're gonna start configuring our security now. So we're gonna choose here a security mode. Let's choose sign and encrypt. 
Okay, so the information is going to be exchanged, it's going to be signed. We looked on the benefits for signing it on the previous slide, and we're going to encrypt that information. So for that, we're going to be asked, when you do that for the first time, to create our client certificate. Okay, so can we create them? Yes. We're going to create, I'm going to enter the information for my certificate that I'm self-signing. So I can put here, vision unit. The information, you have my machine information there. I'm going to put here my state, the expiration date for that uh, the certificate. So I have generated my certificate. Here I get the message. It was successfully uh, generated. So if I need to manually copy that certificate to the servers, here we are telling where we are. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to choose a security policy. So let's uh, choose the basic 256 as the security policy. We can look on the server if the server supports all that. So the server here supports sign and encrypt 256. So yes, it is checked. So if I try now to connect to that server, so I have configured that. If I try now to connect that connection, it fails, okay? Why? Let's look on the server. Let me refresh. I haven't reached uh, the server yet. So first I'm gonna try to configure the server to, uh, I will first allow that server to connect to me. So I'm gonna click here and automatically add the server certificate to my certificate store when I try to connect, which means I know which server I'm going to, I'm going to receive a certificate from the server and I'm gonna trust it, okay? So we do that automatically, I click okay. Now when I try to connect to the server, it fails again, because right now I trust the server, but the server still does not know who I am, okay? So the security checks failed. Let's look on the server, let me refresh. So now the server has received my certificate and has rejected. But the server doesn't know who I am. So I'm gonna get here. On this interface, I'm gonna accept that certificate now. So I'm on the server accepting my certificate. So if I try again now, sure enough, we have successfully connected to the server. So I can click OK now. So all the communications that I configure now, so if I go here, insert a new, net, a new communication, and I put Twincat Secure, all that information is going to be signed and encrypted. If you put a sniffer there, you will not be able to get anything from there unless, of course, you are absolutely extremely uh, smart, knowing how to do all the, 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 the decryption, things like this, which you don't find that often. So I can read again data from the PLC, so that's my double linked uh, variable. I can associate here with my uh, green cat double link, for instance. Okay, so if I start now the OPC UA task, oops, uh, the OPC UA client, there you go. We are going to uh, to connect to the servers, and here we go. We are getting the data from the server, encrypt the data on the second line, and just plain data on the first line. I can write to it. As you can see, it started counting down, counting up again. Here, I'm going to write to this tag here because I configured that to be read and write. So it resets and starts uh, counting up again. Here on the output window, we see all the information that we are receiving, and all this information is encrypted. Okay, so on the same project, I can also connect to multiple OPC servers. So on, on my machine here, let me take a look. Uh, I believe I have, 
other servers here. Give me just one second. So I do have here Cap Server version six. And on Cap Server, here shows the endpoints that I have on Cap Server. Trusted clients, discovered servers, and trusted servers. So right now the list is Cap Server is the only server. And instance certificates. Here it has a certificate. So I can use that certificate uh, as a server if I want to do a uh, secure communication. Okay. We can export the data. So we do have, let's say, more OPC servers here that I can connect to. And if I configure security, I'm going to have to trust uh, my certificate as well. Okay? And this is the trusted server, so if I want to use uh, security, I'm going to have to allow this as well. So the endpoints that we have here, uh, we have the endpoints, if we click on edit, allowing uh, connections with no security or basic 128 and basic 256, sign, sign and encrypt, or both options. Okay, and again, a specific port number for that communication. So, if I open here uh, the configuration for that OPC server, so here it is. We have uh, a few tags configured. We have a uh, some tools with options, you have runtime connections, connectivity. So we have uh, several values here. So if I want to connect to this server as well, right now I can connect using a clear connection. So it's on my own computer. So I'm going to use the uh, Let me open the OPC UA configuration to copy the port again. So here is the URL that I have selected. So it's 49.320. So I'm going to configure that here. And here's the port number. And if I try to connect, here we go. Why did that work? Because I haven't, uh, because I have on the server configured that I allow no security. But if I want to have security, so I'm going to go again, sign and encrypt. I'm going to go here, basic 256. If I try to connect now, boom, I will not allow that server to connect with my clients because I haven't trusted that yet. So I can go again, automatically add the server. So if I connect to the server that I know which server is, I can go and trust the server certificate. So as I connect, I trust that server. Now the error is different. The error now is that this server doesn't know my clients. So I'll have to go here on the trusted clients and add in the soft. So you see on the list here, it shows my client name in the soft, but it doesn't trust me. But it can view my certificates open, oh, issued by in the soft, details, okay. All right, so I like this client. I know who this client is. So I can go ahead and go here and trust that client. So at this point now, if I try again, now I was able to successfully connect to that server. And if I'm not mistaken, I have configured that server to also use authentication. Let me see. Uh, no, it looks like I haven't configured that, and I'm not sure where we configure that on that server. So I'm going to have to remove the user and password. Then he goes. All right. So that's pretty much what we have uh, to present to you guys about the OPC UA secure communications. All right. As you can see, we can uh, reach the next level of uh, cybersecurity using OPC UA. 
I'm going to go back now to our uh, presentation. And let's talk a little bit now about SNMP. So this webinar is not about OPC UA only, it's about interoperability. The traditional way to communicate with devices using drivers, we can use the HMI to be uh, what is supposed to do. I get the data from the PLC, show all the HMI, but it can do much more than that. Uh, it can be a network management software as well. So talking about SNMP, this is a popular protocol used for network management. So can I use my Indusoft Web Studio to check the health of my PLC? Yes, if the PLC supports SNMP and tons of PLCs support SNMP, we can do that. I can do by pooling, as we're going to see there are different ways uh, of accessing that data. Just like any other protocol, it has its own particularities. So when you look here on this, uh, on this slide, we can see that we can use the HMI to get information from switch, from a router, from a printer, from a UPS system, but also from PLCs. Down here, we see a screenshot from ICP desk where they have a SNMP to mod bus converter. So they can acquire information on the SNMP format as well. You can get information from field bus using uh, SNMP information. So any network management software can do this network uh, checking on the health of the devices, timer, information about the device description, and all of this. So SNMP is widely uh, used out there. Some of the concepts of SNMP, it consists on three key components, a managed device, an agent, so that agent is the software that's going to run on the device, okay? And a network management station. Indusoft has both capabilities, can be a network station and also an agent. By that, what do I mean? The manager is the one who's going to be getting the information from the agents or setting information to the agents. Also, the agents can send unsolicited messages, what we call a trap, as you're going to see on the next slide. And also, the manager can be a trap receiver. So look on these agents here as each agent could be a device, independent device. The device can connect to a master agent, or we could go directly to each one of the agents. And by get or set, either I'm reading information from the device or I'm writing an information from that device. So here on this slide, we explain this a little bit better. So a trap is a message that is sent by the device equivalent to an unsolicited message. So uh, if an exception happens, the device sends me the trap message. SNMP get that I'm pulling the device to get the information, or SNMP set, I'm writing a value to that device. And some of the elements, when you're configuring SNMP, when you talk about the address which information I want to read, we're talking about an object identifier, or OID. It's a sequence of numbers separated by dots, so it can create a tree view. And all this information is saved on a table, or what we call the management information base. It's a MID. It's a collection of those variables or of, of those IDs that is shared between the network management uh, station and network elements or the devices, okay? The MID is not, uh, let's say, static. You can uh, expand it. So you can put new MID definitions or new, or new variables that will be shared on the network. And then you're going to talk about the community strings. The community strings is the security part of SNMP, okay? So you define uh, the SNMP as a service on the pretty system. You're going to see how we implement that. And this is just like passwords for the network elements. And you can define if the information is going to be read, write, or both. Looking on this slide here, we see the capabilities that Indusoft has on SNMP. So we do have a communication driver called SNMP. Okay? It supports get and set messages and supports receiving traps and implements SNMP versions 1 and 2. There is a SNMP specification 3. We didn't find uh, too many devices with that yet. We haven't implemented on our driver, but right now we do have one and two. Indusoft also has an SNMP agent that allows other SNMP 
management systems to get information about our project, about Indusoft. So how? They're going to read our tags or they may write values to our tags. And they do have also on WebSuite two built-in functions to get a value from a SNP OID or to write a value to it. So this, this is a quick summary of the features that we have. So first, let's see how we configure SNMP on our machine. SNMP is one of the Windows features. First thing you have to do is to enable that feature. How we do that, control panel, programs and features, turn Windows features on and off, and find here the simple network management. Click here, that's good enough. Okay, if you, if you read the WMI SNMP provider, we don't need that, not for what we're gonna be doing here on Web Studio. Next. Once you install that, you're going to have the service. So if you go to the Windows Services configuration, you're going to find the SNP service there. So if you right-click, you call the properties, you're going to find the uh, SNP service uh, properties window. On the first tab where you have general, if you want to use SNP, ideally you would make that startup type as automatic. So as the computer starts, that's going to be running automatically. Okay? And here shows the status. It's running. If you change anything on the other tabs, you should restart that status for that uh, change to take effect. Next, we can configure the security parts. We talked about the community strings. So here is where we can add or remove community strings. So I created two communities, one called public, one called private. Those are the most commonly uh, used names. Usually private, you put read only, and public, you put read and write. And then on this screenshot here, I'm accessing packages only from my computer. So I can even define host names or IP addresses of who I'm going to communicate through SNMP as well. Or I can accept SNMP messages from anybody, from any host. And also, when we talk about traps, I can go here on my computer and configure it to send traps automatically. And traps, again, are unsolicited messages. So I can, from this computer, send a message to another SNP agent. For instance, into soft information, alarms. I configure alarms, and the alarm changes. I want to send that alarm to another uh, trap receiver. So I will enter here the IP address of that trap receiver. Okay? So on Web Studio, if I want to use the SNP agent, so other devices are going to access my information, we have to configure one SNMP.ini file like this, okay? We have to register our uh, SNMP agent. By default, that is already registered when you install Web Studio. But sometimes when you install different versions of Web Studio on the same machine, we're going to have registered the latest version that we have installed. So it's good for you to go on the bin folder. You're going to find this uh, Studio SNMP register, DXD, execute it, and going to be registering our agent. So here you can see on the SNMP INI file some of the uh, samples on how to exchange data for SNMP. So I created an OID 1.2, the item type, the strings, the access. So one is read only, the other is read and write. So uh, the tag is called time. So I'm going to be read only. <coughs> System tag, sorry. And traps. So whenever my uh, tag, uh, my trigger changes, like every second, I would be sending a trap. So if I have another network management system that speaks SNMP and is able to receive traps, every second I'm going to receive my information. What type of information? My date and time, for instance. Or I could be sending my alarms. And whenever my alarm changes, I'm going to send that information. Okay? So we do not have a user interface for this INI file, but it's very easy to be configured. You can see on this screenshot. Uh, so we can configure and other SNMP device can receive information from our agents. So let's do a live demo. What do we have here on our live demo? I have one computer, my computer here, with Indusoft Web Studio and another third-party software called iReasoning, and that I'm using only to double-check the values, what I have in Web Studio and what uh, iReasoning reads must be the same thing. And I'm connecting through SNP to a printer that we have here in the office and also to a Schneider Electric PLC <coughs> excuse me, M340. So I can get information about that PLC. So let's take a look on that. I'm going to 
stop this. I, I'm going to change the projects now. So I have pre-configured this project so we can uh, gain some time. And I'm going to use, again, our database pie because we're going to be uh, checking some specific values using debug mode. So the first thing you're going to look is the SNP communication driver. Very simple to be configured. Okay, so here I put the Web Studio uh, task or uh, tags that we have, the station that I'm going to access, and the OID of that device. What is the OID? It's, you know, the network tree view where the information that I'm looking for is. On this station, I can configure more things. If you look on the help file, you're going to see that on this station, we can enter here the community, if it's private, if it's public, the access, if it's read-only, and the port number, if the port is not the default uh, SNMP port number. So as a quick test, we are going to look on this tag here, SNMP test. Okay, I'm going to uh, look on my local host on this specific OID. What is this OID? Using this uh, other software that was created specifically for that, I'm going to enter here 127. And as I select some of these specific uh, members, I see here the OID. So if I want to read on that IP address the system description, this is the OID for that. So I'm using this same OID on my Web Studio. Uh, screen here. So I'm going to cut this guys for now. I'm going to save this so I can uh, add them later. Okay. So right now I'm going to only communicate to get that information. So SNP test is here. So if I go and start the driver only, again, just running the bug, here we go. I'm reading that description. So it's reading my computer information. If I use the iReasoning and read that information, so I put here the OID. Let me uh, clean up this. So, <coughs> so here's the OID. I click on Get. And here's the information. It matches. So we are reading the same information. Okay, so on my own computer, that's very easy to to read. So let's look on something else. What, what do I have uh, here on my table? Let's look on a remote device. So we're going to look on the same OID now, but from a remote device. I'm going to look on my Schneider Electric PLC. So I'm going to go here, and I enter my Schneider Electric IP address because I have configured SNMP on it same OID, so I'm on the system description. And let's see which value I have on my SNMP PLC. So as I save my worksheet here, I already got the data. So here shows my Shine Electric M340, BMX, all the information that I need about that PLC. Okay, let's take a look on the other device that I have here on the network. I have a printer on this IP address. So let me read that. So here is my printer. It's a broader printer. So let me get my SNP from the printer. I'm going to configure here. Let me save it. And here's information about the printer. <coughs> so I'm reading information, excuse me. So I'm reading information about those devices using SNMP. Simple enough, right? SNMP driver. So IP address, OID, and we have that information using the driver. So what uh, what more information can I read? So if I go here uh, using the iReasoning, we have a better description of which one is. So I have, for instance, system uptime. So I have that my print has been running for over uh, 1,500 hours. Can I read that information? Yeah, I just use the same OID here. Should go to my printer. 
I'm going to put that information on another tag. It's going to be my printer one. And on my printer one here, I have the integer number of seconds for how long that printer is being running. And I have the same information about the PLC, for instance. Okay, so if I put here my PLC, and I'm going to put the tag for the PLC, same OID. There you go. This is for how long my PLC has been running. That's standard PLC. Okay, so this is to show that you can talk to network devices. Indusoft has the features to do that. This is the first feature that we are showing, which is the driver. And we do have also <coughs> other features as well. So I have configured the agent. And our agent has the enterprise ID 26640 by default. So if I start my, uh, my project here now, So I'm starting my runtime on Web Studio. So I have configured here a tag that's going to receive the values using our built-in function. So how is that called? I put SNP get. Here I enter the IP address of where I'm trying to get the information from, community name, OID, and the tag that's going to receive that information. So I'm just create a tag called A. I'm going to show the value here. So here, I'm going to get my system information into my tag A. I go here, get, and I got zero, which means it executed successful, and here's the information about that. Okay? And as I said, we can expose Web Studio information. So I have a tag here. For instance, I have tag B that I'm going to type here, test. When I execute this test here, or this one here, I'm getting a value from the tag B and use SNMP, I'm reading that value. So let's look on another device. Let me copy this OID here. And I'm going to go to I reasoning. I'm going to select my local IP address. I'm going to enter my OID that I want here, and I'm going to execute. So here's the value. The value is test. If I change the value of this tag, if I put here set, I can put a specific value here. Set, when I look on my Web Studio project, I have received webinar test. A value that I have changed it from there. If I get that value now, here, it's webinar test. Okay, so using SNMP, we are exchanging information. So right now, I'm exchanging with iReasoning, but we are getting values from Web Studio tags into the SNMP uh, management system. That's uh, the beauty of it. And using our functions, we can read values from all these devices as well. So all the OIDs that uh, we are reading there, I can create here calls to read those values as well. So just uh, the quick example that we did for the function was, I go ahead and I read the hardware information from my computer. I could duplicate this and get that information from another device. So uh, we do have here the PLC with the IP 10 to 29 here. So when I execute this second one, this new button here, the information I get on my tag A is my Schneider Electric PLC. All right. So with this, we are going to move to our Q&A session. So I'm open for some questions. I'm going to read the ones that we already have on the chat. On the chat. And uh, also on the Q&A so let me open here the Q&A. Please submit your questions, and depending on the question, I may reply to everybody or only to uh, that specific uh, user. So <coughs> we got a question here. Can I set up a full-time interval 
on OPC way. So back to OPC way here. Let me stop. Let me go to the OPC way. When we are configuring the OPC way worksheet, we have here the publish rate, which is uh, an information we pass to the server. This, I'm telling the server, get data every 1,000 uh, milliseconds and send the data to me. Okay, if I put this every 5,000 seconds, I get to read the data only every five seconds. So I'm uh, connecting now, and you're going to see that the second tag is going to update it faster than the first one. And the first one is going to be updating only every five seconds. Okay, so the question is, can I put a tag in here? So if I put a tag in here, I'm going to be asking to create a tag. I create that. So I put here publish rate. And I'm going to copy that tag to put here. So I'm going to put by default a value of uh, 10 milliseconds. Okay, so I'm going to start again. So as you can see, I'm getting value really fast now from that server one. And then I'm gonna go during the run time and change that value. So now I'm gonna receive only every second. Ooh, I'm still receiving a lot. What happened? So what happened is for this publish rate here to take effect, we have to configure also a reload trigger. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I configure here a tag, whenever this tag here change the value, then we're going to update that type of information from the server. So I'm going to put here a reload trigger. So right now, we are receiving values every second on both, right? I'm going to even reset this. We're going to start counting up again. You can see it's counting up again. And I'm going to change this guy. So I'm going to change this to 10. So only by changing, it did not start going any faster. You can see here on the output window, it's still slow. When I do the reload trigger, now it's going faster. Okay, so I have to change. Let's say prepare the value that I want. So I'm going to put here like uh, 3,000, and then I'm going to execute the trigger. And now I'm slow again. Okay, I hope that answers the question. So yeah, during the run time, you can change the publish rate. So that's the pooling time. The only thing you have to do is to use the reload trigger. All right. So we are uh, past about 10 minutes uh, after the hour. I would like you, uh, the other questions that I have here, I'm going to reply to all the ones, we have information from you guys. So I'm gonna reply to you guys with the answer that you have. Uh, we're gonna have to uh, close now. Uh, how I'm gonna reply here is how to contact Indusoft. You guys may write us if you have any specific questions about today's webinar or any information about Indusoft at all, you got on this slide our email addresses, our phone numbers, our offices in uh, here in Austin, Texas, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and in uh, Waldorf, Germany. And you can talk to us in English, Portuguese, German, Spanish. We got plenty of uh, different language speakers here in the company. So with this, I would like to thank you all for your participation, for taking your time to watch this webinar. I hope it was as instructive for you guys as it intended to be. We're going to have another one starting at 3 p.m. today, Central Standard Time. If you wanted to attend or if you want to recommend this to anyone, you can, you can attend that. This has been recorded. It's going to be on our website. So if there's any part you want to watch again, you'll be able to do that soon. You should receive a survey pretty soon. If you reply to that survey, as a token of appreciation, we're going to send you a T-shirt from our webinar series. So. 
this will always help us to get better and to get better subjects and uh, better uh, assistance to all you guys. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.